Uh, good morning, everyone. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Welcome to the uh, annual uh, Mario S. Verani uh, Memorial Lectureship. Uh, as you know, this uh, lectureship is dedicated to Dr. Mario Verani, who was a director of nuclear cardiology here from 1984 Cindy, until 2001, on when unfortunately he developed pancreatic cancer and, uh, and passed away. Dr. Verani uh, is uh, known for many, many uh, uh, different uh, contributions to nuclear cardiology and cardiology. He uh, has authored, he had authored over 200 papers in, in his lifetime. He was an energetic and very personable individual, and I'm, I'm afraid most of you probably never had a chance to meet him, but would have been, uh, it would have been a pleasure for all of you to do so. He, uh, as I said, he ran the uh, nuclear cardiology laboratory for 16 years and was really my mentor, and, uh, and uh, we had a, had a very close relationship. Uh, one of his uh, greatest uh, accomplishments, I think, in, in cardiology and nuclear cardiology was actually to bring forth the whole concept of pharmacologic stress testing. And, um, and uh, the group here at Methodist was the first to really uh, uh, promote uh, the use of adenosine as a pharmacologic stressor agent. And, um, and as I said, uh, Mario was really uh, pivotal in, in accomplishing all of these, uh, these different achievements. Uh, Mario was also uh, one of the first presidents of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and, uh, and spent uh, tremendous amounts of time both uh, internationally and nationally uh, teaching and, and uh, offering his expertise. So in all respects, uh, this memorial lectureship is, is dedicated to a very special individual who we all remember with, with great fondness. Uh, every year we bring a, a, uh, a unique uh, speaker and, a, and, and someone who's excellent in the field of nuclear cardiology uh, as a testament to Mario to, 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 to um, uh, give us some insights regarding how we do things on a day-to-day -day basis. This year is no different. Uh, this year we have Dr. Gregory Thomas who uh, has been in nuclear cardiology for, we were reminiscing last night, for the last 30 years, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and have been uh, to, uh, doing things together over the years uh, in terms of both research and, 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 um, and uh, societal uh, uh, issues. Uh, Dr. Thomas um, uh, went to the University of California for his undergraduate degree and then went to medical school also at the University of California in San Francisco. He then did his internship at Mass General and his residency at Mass General in Cedar sinai Hospital. He has uh, published over 200 uh, articles over the years in nuclear cardiology. Uh, he is uh, one of the past presidents of the American Society of, Card of Nuclear Cardiology uh, and, uh, and uh, really spearheaded a tremendous uh, efforts during his, uh, during his presidency in terms of integrating nuclear cardiology with cardiovascular CT. and. And, and other modalities which we feel really is so important in terms of what we do today. And in fact, as our fellows know, we, we really stress multimodality imaging at, at the highest level now. And uh, that again was spearheaded by Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas now is the medical director of the Memorial Care Health and Vascular Institute at Long Beach Memorial. Uh, his uh, research accomplishments have been really very varied. They have, they have varied from uh, exploring atherosclerotic disease in mummies in uh, Egypt and South America uh, to uh, the uh, evaluation of pharmacologic stressor agents, uh, uh, specifically regadenosin. And uh, this morning he is going to talk about uh, pharmacologic stress and where it fits into how we routinely do nuclear cardiac imaging uh, with uh, some new results from the Exerc study, which just got uh, presented uh, last month at the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Gregory Thomas. Thank you, John. Um, it's uh, indeed an, an incredible honor to, to be here to uh, moralize um, to Mario and uh, to be in the hallowed halls of Methodist. Um, you represented some of the incredible achievements that you've accomplished here over the years. Um, I come, as John said, from Long Beach Memorial. Um, we too have a long history, 100 years uh, at a hospital 
um, also involved in stress testing. Um, this is a picture of uh, Merv Elistat before and now. Merv Elistat, at the same time Bruce was developing maximal treadmill testing, also put people on the treadmill. And at that time, 60 years ago, um, they thought that hard, um, we shouldn't take a patient with possible coronary disease above a heart rate of 100. We didn't know what would happen. Uh, but being a typical bravado cardiologist, you guys know that here at Methodist as well, um, he said, well, why not go more? And so he developed maximal exercise testing at that time 60 years ago. Um, that's Merv on, the, on your right now. He's 94, and um, he's still active. There's no early retirement. He's writing the sixth edition of his um, classic um, exercise uh, testing book. Um, we've been thinking a lot about innovation in our system. Um, there's um, hospitals particularly want, uh, would like physicians to follow guidelines um, and follow evidence-based medicine, but sometimes that's in conflict with changing medicine, which we want to do to make medicine better. So we asked Merv, who can't hear anymore, but so reads on, on an iPhone, um, <clears throat> what, uh, what the physicians around him thought about maximal exercise testing when he started that um, 60 years ago. Let's see if this sound works here. What resistance? occurred when you started doing that. Oh, most of the internists thought I was nuts. Yeah. The, um, so if you've got a crazy idea, for example, um, maximal stress testing or looking for atherosclerosis in mummies, I would suggest go ahead and design a trial and develop that and um, see if it's crazy or not, um, because that's how we change medicine going forward. Um, Mario is indeed an, an incredible man. Um, incredible innovator, investigator, educator, and leader. I met him as a young nuclear cardiologist coming up and remember his, him being so kind and uh, gracious um, to so many people. Um, a number of first um, that Mario accomplished, um, defects that were fixed, thought to be SCAR. Um, spec quantitation um, developed um, here and at Cedars in 1988 and with a young John Mamarian um, on that paper as well. Um, and then adenosine stress testing, which really put nuclear cardiology on the map. Um, prior to that time, we had dipritamol, an imperfect agent, uh, but after that, we were able to um, scan any patient who came down for stress testing. If they couldn't exercise, we could go ahead and use adenosine stress, which has really um, allowed that field to blossom and mature um, over these 30 years. He also is a great leader and a bit of a rabble-rouser. Um, the Society of Nuclear Medicine um, had a, this group of individuals here, they felt that the nuclear cardiology wasn't, not enough attention was paid to that in the nuclear medicine field. So they split off and developed ASNIC. And here Mario on your left um, was the first secretary of ASNIC as they performed that, that, developed that society. During his presidency years, a few years later, a number of other firsts, the first tutorial in nuclear cardiology, that's become the annual scientific sessions of ASNIC right now. 700 people attended that first tutorial. Um, they also, he and his colleagues also developed the ability for cardiologists to become nuclear cardiologists, uh, working with the Na Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, to, uh, to convince them to allow a 200-hour radioisotope handling course to be allowed to be used in addition to clinical training to get a limited license to evaluate, to use radioisotopes um, for patients. In most of the rest of the world, um, nuclear medicine physicians or radiologists are the only ones allowed to use isotopes. It was these Again, these rabble rousers challenging authority and challenging um, the clinical court, the typical course, um, to change it so that in this case cardiologists or others could get a limited license. Um, as well, uh, as part of that, they developed the CBNC, the Nuclear Cardiology Board Exam, during his, uh, his year as presidency, and also laboratory accreditation to try to bring the level of quality up in all those labs. And now, as you know, Outpatient laboratories are required by Medicare if they'd like to get paid to be accredited. So a number of firsts during that period of time. Um, he's left a number of legacies, including um, Angela and Don, John Marion um, here on the right. John's aged pretty well, as you can tell. It was a long time ago. Um, and he's also developed the legacy of pharmacologic stress. And I and others who've continued that field really are continuing his work to change medicine and make medicine better. Uh, really an incredible man, and again, such a wonderful honor um, to be invited to address you today. Um, in terms of disclosures, the study sponsor for the EXERT trial is Estellus. They make regadenosine, and I've been a consultant for them um, for a number of years. Looking at uh, back in terms of the evolution of pharmacologic stress as we try to add to it um, with this new study, 
Um, the first generation of pharmacologic stress was dipritamol, uh, indirectly increasing adenosine, um, popularized in the United States by Lance Gould and his colleagues in 1978 with this paper. Um, we've added exercise to regadenosine for many years. I um, mean, indeed, in looking back at these papers almost 40 years ago, the same thing occurred with the initial use of dipritamol when he walked patients in place um, prior to giving them the radio tracer. Um, Second generation is really the direct vasodilator with the Denison stress, again, uh, developed um, right here um, at Methodist by Dr. Brani and, and a young John Mamarian. Um, initially, when adenosine came out, it stimulated the adenosine receptors, but over time, we realized that there's not just one adenosine receptor, there's at least four, A1 receptor, 2A and 2B, and A3 receptors. And the person who developed their, who, um, who discovered the A2A receptor and also found that it mediates the vasodilatation, which is what we want to use when we're trying to, vaso, when we're trying to use vasodilator stress to open the arteries to get differential flow and then image that differential flow to determine stenosis, was Luis Bernardelli, a, a Brazilian-American MD-PhD, initially at Virginia, then Florida, um, and then in California. So he developed the A2A receptor and published this in 1998 um, and immediately went to just try to develop an, a pharmaceutical agent that could stimulate that A2A receptor and not all the other adenosine receptors to decrease the side effects of adenosine testing. So by this time, he was with Cardiovascular Therapeutics, or CBT, the company that also developed, he developed as well, or Renolazine or, um, or Renexa. And he worked with Brent Blackburn, a PhD, um, another Texan, <coughs> um, who... Uh, and they worked to try to develop an agent that would be very specific to the A2A receptor, again, the receptor that causes vasodilatation, and it would last a while. Adenosine, as you know, has a, side of, has a, a half-life of 10 seconds, but they wanted something they could give as a bolus and would last two or three minutes to allow the isotope um, to clear into the myocardium for multiple passes enough so that they would uh, be able to give it as a bolus and not a continuous drip. So they tested about 100 molecules, and one of them, CVT3146, that John and I had the opportunity to work with um, over those um, preclinical and then, uh, early clinical years um, in testing. And this is the molecule here on the right with additional side chain that's very specific to for the A2A receptor um, with minimal effects on the A1 receptor, which is the receptor that blocks the effect of the AV node, causes AV block with adenosine, and that's why we give adenosine in the ER, for example, for SVT. Uh, minimal effects on the A2B, which is that causes peripheral vasodilatation, and A3, um, which may be involved with bronchoconstriction um, and other um, aspects of adenosine. But again, we want something that stimulates A2A as that sp uh, selective um, agonist. So that's the third generation of uh, pharmacologic tracers with regadenosine. Challenges remain, however. One of the issues with regadenosine um, and any pharmacologic stress is we increase blood flow everywhere, not just to the heart, whereas exercise is increases blood flow to the heart, less to the gut. It's kind of like your mom told you not to, um, not to go into the water um, after you'd had a meal because you're going to get a stomach upset. Um, so if you exercise, you have more of an uh, increase in blood flow to your heart, less uh, imaging in the gut, or less isotope in the gut, so you get better pictures. So we and others have added exercise and continue to try to do that to use a combination hybrid approach. Um, adverse effects continue with regadenosine, including headache, flushing, abdominal pain, and nausea. And some patients just don't like that feeling with it, and occasionally patients will refuse to come back for another one. Um, so again, how do we address those, uh, those side effects? So we and others have looked at combining exercise um, with um, adenosine. Um, the MGH group up talk, our group um, in California, the Yale group, and then the groups um, at Northwestern. Um, in all of these studies, um, adenosine with its 10-second half-life is started um, in as an infusion. The patient has walked at a low level for between four, to si between four to six minutes, and then the tracer injected in the middle. And that's been found to decrease side effects. Um, it causes a mild impact on hemodynamics. Um, here, for example, in our study, Showing on the left, um, the Adeno-X patients, 500 patients observed in an observational study compared to those who didn't exercise. Um, maximum heart rate increase being 90, heart, 90 beats per minute just with adenosine, 106 um, with patients who walk at a low level um, during adenosine. Um, maximum heart rate 60% versus 52%. 
an increase in heart rate of 18 in the patients just with the denison and 37 of those patients who walked, and a mild bump in blood pressure of 8 um, with that low-level um, exercise. So what we found, as others did, is much less AV block. Again, with the denison, we have a, this AV block issue because it's stimulating the A1 receptors, and that was decreased by 50% of those patients who walked. Um, in combining our study with some of the others on the left, uh, there was significantly less side effects. Patients were happier to have undergo an adenosine exercise protocol, um, less AV block, mild increase in systolic blood pressure and heart rate. But particularly important for those who read these studies is better image quality, less gut um, activity, better heart-to-background ratio as we measure it. So that's better ability to interpret studies, and that's a better ability to find ischemia when we combine adenosine with exercise. And as um, Tom Hawley showed and others have showed, uh, an enhanced sensitivity to look for ischemia, uh, maybe because of a double stress, but more likely because the images are better, we're able to image, read them better because we don't have gut overlap on the inferior wall, for example. And as we look at adding exercise to this, um, this, um, initial, this slide from Walker's, when he evaluated Sestamibi um, years ago, on the left we see the heart <coughs> um, activity here over time. Here's the activity from the radio tracer, here's time. Here's the heart. We want to take, the heart's what we want to take a picture of. Um, and we have much more activity in the liver, a lot of activity in the spleen and the gut in here with rest. Whereas if we exercise, we have much more activity in the heart, much less in the gut. So much easier to interpret these patients. So as we add low level exercise, um, we, we blend these things. So we get a better picture um, of the heart uh, compared to the other um, organs. So well, we went ahead and worked with cardiovascular therapeutics to develop uh, what we call the REGX protocol, <clears throat> which is commonly used around <clears throat> the U.S. and the world at this time. It was a randomized double-blind placebo versus active control um, pilot study using regadenosin with low-level exercise, taking what we'd learned with the denison and adding, using that new, new tracer, regadenosin, with that. <clears throat> so what we did is we took patients who could qualify for a denison supine, as shown in the left. Patients underwent a supine protocol, the six-minute protocol developed here. Um, and then they're randomized in a two-to-one fashion to regadenison plus exercise, walking at 1.7 miles in the flat, 39 patients. The other group is randomized to placebo given during exercise, 21 patients. Um, a core reader, core lab readers, um, Dr. Jane Schwartz and Williams. Um, so in a little more detail, those patients at the top they underwent the active therapy. 39 patients walked at 1.7 miles per hour on the flat. Um, we, just, we wanted them to walk for a while to get the exercise effect. That's why we came up with the 1.5 minutes prior to giving the regadenosin. And then we gave Tracer 30 seconds later, giving the regadenosin over 10 seconds. Um, and we recommend that, continue to recommend that, as that's where the studies were done to show when, when to give a Tracer after that 10-second period of time. 20 seconds after the end of the 10 seconds. So again, um, three, 30 seconds after the beginning of the 10 second infusion or bolus, we give Sestamibi. We decided to have them continue to walk for a while as the tracer is taken up by the heart to continue to try to get more blood to the heart compared to the gut. And then we patients image those patients 60 minutes later by protocol. Um, whereas the uh, one third of the patients were randomized to placebo, those patients walked on the, on the treadmill. We injected uh, what we didn't know, but we were injecting placebo, and then injected a placebo tracer, so no tracer. And then they were put under the camera, but uh, they were not, uh, there was no imaging done because they didn't have a tracer injected. So what we found um, was a significant improvement in patient tolerability. As you can see um, with the Denison supine, in this column here, 39 patients, um, compared to those patients undergoing regadenosin with exercise, much less flushing, much less headache, uh, less stomach discomfort, um, less abdominal pain. And those of you who do these tests with regadenosin, for example, realize, know that patients are often feeling something, some discomfort in their abdomen um, and uh, nausea, sometimes even diarrhea. And that's likely an effect of some A2 receptor in the gut that we haven't resolved yet in terms of what exactly it is. But we're seeing a significant amount of that. And so um, we've seen significantly less, however, when we combine low-level exercise with that. So much less, much better tolerability. Um, we did feel, see an increase, look at the hemodynamics, um, an increase in heart rate, as you can see in red, the patients undergoing REGEX, heart rate increased 115, whereas those patients underwent placebo exercise in green. 
Um, there, with low of exercise, got a heart rate of 95, so 20 points higher or so in those patients who, under, who got um, ragged innocent during the low of exercise. Um, and then looking at, um, and let's look at that in more detail. Um, one of the interesting things we found uh, as Reg and Innocent came out, we saw a higher increase in heart rate, a greater increase in heart rate with Reg and Innocent than we did with, with Adenosine. We used to think that the reason that the heart rate went up with Adenosine was because it decreased blood pressure and it was a reflex increase in the heart rate. Um, but with Reg and Innocent, which is a, a bigger dose, it's one dose fits all, so in small people it's a pretty significant dose. Um, we saw a higher increase with regadenosin. And however, looking, so looking at that in more detail, it was found that there's, a, there's an A2A receptor in the carotid body. Um, as we talked about, regadenosin is very selective for A2A receptors. There's also regadenosin or A2A receptor in the carotid body. And when we stimulate the A2A receptor in the heart, we increase, we cause coronary vasodilatation. When we stimulate the A2A receptor in the carotid body, we release norepinephrine. So in this rat model, you can see very quickly an increase in norepinephrine, a doubling in norepinephrine almost immediately after it's injected. So we see a norepinephrine level here, um, much higher and staying higher over that period of time um, in these, uh, the rat model. Um, and so this is interesting, going to talk to Bernadette Adeli about it. Um, and what this, we believe this is what causes that, uh, that gasp or that pause. For those of you doing this test, when people get ragged innocent, for example, a minute later or so, they'll feel some kind of hit that, that something's affected them. They've got to take a deep breath. And what you or the nurses or physiologists do is they say it'll go away, it'll get better, just relax. So that's a mini panic attack. So that's the, the bolus of norepinephrine they're getting. So that's what we do. We tell them to relax. And so I'll remember the day you're talking to Luis about it, and he said that's exactly what it is. It's a mini panic attack to do that. So the, what we've been doing all along, reassuring them, um, is because that norepinephrine, and that will gradually go down um, over time. <clears throat> so that's why we get that increase in heart rate um, with any of these agents. Um, <clears throat> looking, continued looking at the hemodynamics, looking at systolic blood pressure in the patients with low level exercise in the REGX protocol. Um, green and red about the same, um, increase in heart rate with the exercise to about 145 compared to a, um, or excuse me, increase in systolic blood pressure compared to those patients with adenosine having a mild drop in blood pressure. But not a, not a dramatic increase in blood pressure there with this low level exercise protocol. And as we would hope, we saw an improvement in target to background ratio. For example, particularly, um, it's best, best, most important in the gut. When we took a look at the at red, uh, region of interest in the gut, um, five pixels below the heart, and compared that to the myocardium we see in red, a better target to background ratio in those patients who walked um, dur during the time they got ragged innocent compared to those patients who got ragged innocent at rest. Here's a representative example um, from our paper. This is a patient who undergoing low level exercise with ragged innocent compared to that same patient undergoing, um, actually this is, yes, undergoing adenosine alone here. Um, so we compared ragged innocent, the, the new agent that was under study at the time, to the older agent, adenosine. So we see a significant improvement in quality when we combine um, exercise um, with pharmacologic stress. Um, our core readers agreed. And so on the left, we can see that looking at the overall side-by-side um, -side quality, 26% of the time the images were interpreted as better in a blinded readers. Uh, the rest were the same. None were interpreted as worse and even a little bit better for when we looked, asked them to look just at um, gut interference. We did see a mild increase in the amount of ischemia seen. I mean, this slide, the upper panel, this shows the number of segments that were reversible, read by the blinded readers. And this is the number of patients, for example, two patients. Um, this is, and this is the number of reversible agreements, reversible defects in those patients who had more defects when they underwent the REGX protocol compared to those going to going to Dennis and Supine. Um, a mild increase in uh, the amount of ischemia determined. Uh, with that. Patients also felt better. 70% of patients um, felt better undergoing ragged innocent with exercise than ragged innocent supine. So our conclusion was that it was feasible to add low level exercise to ragged innocent with an increase in heart rate, um, patient tolerability, um, and particularly improvement in image quality. So following that initial study, there have been several um, large studies done, observational studies that have confirmed the results. Um, where, and it's become a standard protocol 
um, for use to decrease side effects with regadenosine. It adds to the complexity of it, um, but it does um, have those significant advantages. So what else have we learned about regadenosine over the period of time, almost a decade that it's been available? Um, it's been widely accepted. It's now used in 80% of pharmacologic stress studies in the United States, and now with um, the rapid scan company available in many countries around the world. Um, one of the things that's likely, <clears throat> I think, unfortunate, though, is it's become so easy to use that we use pharmacologic stress uh, much more than we used to. Um, and so it's easier for, uh, for example, hospitals to just order a Reganinus or LexisScan study um, because patients can then, every patient can undergo that as opposed to undergoing exercise test. But exercise is the ideal form of stress in that we can determine uh, exercise duration, we can determine symptoms, we don't have to pay for the agent, um, and we can look at ischemia and symptoms with exercise um, as well. So it's become almost too easy to do that. Um, one of the things we found is its selectivity for the A2A receptor that Bernardelli and Blackburn tried to develop. Um, they hit, they nailed it. Um, it's been shown to be safe in moderate to severe COPD, in mild to moderate asthma, in both of those populations who are stable. It's not been studied in patients who are unstable in terms of patients with pneumonia or bronchospasm active at the time. Um, bronchospasm has been rarely seen clinically when given, uh, whereas with adenosine, because it stimulated um, the adenosine stimulates one of the adenosine receptors that causes the bronchoconstriction, and so we haven't seen that again because of this selectivity. Um, we used to use dobutamine a great deal in patients who had COPD or asthma. Uh, now we rarely use dobutamine um, across the United States, which has been a, a great, um, great import given the significant side effect profile of whipping the heart uh, with dobutamine. Um, also, it's been selective. It's been minimal, minimal effects on the A1 receptor. We've rarely seen second or third degree heart rate with regadenosine. One of the things we don't know, though, is the optimal duration for regadenosine. Xiao Liu did the initial study with the University of Florida folks and f injected it over 10 seconds, found that the tracer, found that the uh, vasodilatation was near maximum um, 30 seconds after the beginning, stayed high for two to three minutes. So we give it over 10 seconds. That's a good time. We know when to give the tracer. However, people have seen anecdotally that if you increase the amount of time you give regadenosin over 15 or 20 seconds, you decrease these GI side effects. So people tend to do that. But it, that, the challenge with that is we don't know when to give the tracer then. We don't, there have been no cath lab studies that show when to give tracer, when we're getting maximal vasodilatation to give the tracer. So I recommend giving it over a 10 second period of time given that's what the, the, the data showed. Um, off label, um, it's not. Uh, on the label to use for patients with renal uh, dysfunction or on dialysis, but it certainly appears to be safe. There's no A2A receptors that are known in the kidney. Um, there's a triple half-life um, or triple half-life uh, presentation with regadenosine, about three minutes in the blood, 30 minutes in the organs, two hours in the kidney, um, longer if you have renal dysfunction. Um, but there's, since there's no A2A receptors in the kidney, it should be safe in renal patients. And again, it's off-label, but there's been significant number of patients evaluated by the lab at the University of Alabama, as well as at Rush by Dukey. Um, patients are doing well with that. And as we discussed, the REGX protocol, combining with low-love exercise, um, has done well. Um, <clears throat> I want to bring up another an uncommon side effect we've seen that I've been talking to Dr. Mamarian about and what, what could be causing this. And rarely we're seeing asystole. Um, which we don't recall seeing much at all with adenosine. Um, and there's been six case reports, and let me share, you, uh, share those with you. Um, this lab study from uh, Rosenblatt and Cohen in Maine, patient came in for evaluation for regadenosine study, published last year in Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, normal looking EKG, mild changes after the regadenosine, and then no heart rate, um, CPR, um, no heart rate at all here, um, no clear P waves, um, and st uh, doing CPR for about 20 seconds, patient came back, EKG came back, patient admitted to the hospital, um, the stress images performed at the hospital compared to the resting images performed as an outpatient, uh, no ischemia seen, only mild coronary disease on the catheterization. Um, they continued to use regadenosine, and two months later, another patient came in um, with atrial fibrillation, um, 40 seconds after the regadenosine, uh, no heart rate. Um, they started CPR. Um, heart rate came back in the 30s and 40s. Um, came back for about a minute, then the heart rate um, came down to zero again. CPR started again. 
uh, the patient um, EKG gradually uh, rhythm came back, um, and the patient um, did well. By this time, they knew it had occurred, so they sent the patient home. Um, after studying the patient, um, no ischemia is seen on that patient's nuclear study. So they reported it in JNC in their first 2,700 doses they, of administering regadenis in two patients developed asystole and hemodynamic collapse. Um, they compared it to the 9,000 patients who had received adenosine in the years before, and they didn't see a single case, as they described it, of hemodynamic collapse or asystole. Um, they do continue to use regadenosin, and let's look at a couple more of the case reports. Um, they injected over 15 seconds uh, regadenosin. Um, and again, the package insert and the studies were done at 10 seconds. Um, so looking at the Royal Brompton experience, which has been a, a, um, a pioneer with um, adenosin stress um, as well as with Methodist, um, they looked at um, this study that I was uh, fortunate enough to review. Um, they looked at the adverse effects in the first um, year or two of use, 1,500 patients, um, and they found that one of the patients had asystole, underwent, and then underwent CPR. This is a patient who is a 67-year-old patient with a BMI of a 33 Asian uh, male, underwent, um, again, 10 seconds of asystole. Another patient... Um, 30 seconds of asystole, received aminophilin and, and um, atropine, also CPR. This is an Asian woman, uh, BMI of 33. Um, they also used a 15-second injection. In speaking to Richard Underwood, the senior author of the paper, um, he, uh, either he or his team ob uh, observed these, obviously, and, um, and he said both of these patients uh, had nausea prior to this asystole. And they called it in their paper a basal vagal reaction. They thought it was severe because the basal vagal was causing the asystole. And he believed that um, they gave aminophilin and atropine, and he believed that they responded better to atropine than aminophilin. So aminophilin, as you know, coats all the adenosine receptors. So when we're using adenosine or regadenosine, we want to reverse it. We give aminophilin. Aminophilin, because the adenosine or regadenosine is coming on and off the receptors. Well, if you give aminophilin, it coats the receptors. So competitively, regadenosine can't get on the receptor, so it's going to reverse any, any effect that's immediate and caused by the A2A receptors. However, if the effect is related to another effect that continues, for example, if, you, if regadenosine is causing a basal vagal response, um, you can stop the effect of regadenosine, but that basal vagal response may, continue, may have a life of its own and continue. So that's why he felt that atropine um, had helped the patients. Um, and then at ICNIC this year, um, which is the spring every other year meeting at, uh, of ASNIC um, and the European Society of Cardiology and Nuclear Medicine, um, came across a poster from a private practice in Munich where they'd looked at 2,500 patients, um, and two of them also had asystole um, in this um, data set. Each was successfully treated with aminophilin and atropine. Um, they didn't, uh, they gave both, and that's what you tend to do if someone's got asystole, you're going to throw in the kitchen sink. Um, and they used a 20-second injection. So what can we conclude from these six cases of asystole? It's rare. It's not a reason not to use the agent. I don't know if it's 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000. I think it's at least 1 in 100,000 from what I've heard anecdotally. Um, <clears throat> there's, at each of them, a prolonged in infusion was used, 15 to 20 seconds, so somehow... Perhaps it wasn't seen in the earlier studies um, because uh, the 10-second infusion was used. Um, potential causes include, as Underwood suggests, an increase in vagal tone, and maybe that's a direct effect from stimulation of an unrecognized A2A receptor. We didn't know until recently that the A2A receptor is in the carotid body causing an increase in norepinephrine, but maybe there's another receptor, um, A2A receptor, that causes this SA effect on the SA node to, to cause asystole, for example. Or maybe it's indirect, as suggested by the Royal Brompton team, because of a basal vagal effect. Um, and so the treatment I would consider, I would um, consider atropine. Um, and if this occurs with you guys, let me know, or someone else. I'm very much interested in, in what works um, when this rare condition. I would give aminophilin as well in case it is a direct effect. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that could of this, we don't recall it occurring with the denison. Uh, but perhaps it actually did occur with the denison, and we just attributed it to third-degree AV block. Um, it seemed to be separate for regadenison and a new side effect, but with adenosine, 
Um, we knew that some patients stop, or some patients get third degree V block, but it doesn't last long at all because it's 10 second half life. So maybe we're actually seeing it with the denison, um, but didn't recognize it as an asystole effect. Um, so moving back to some of the other areas with regadenosin, um, it presents an, an opportunity for the potential of a universal protocol. Um, adenosin, we have to decide prior to the test if we're going to use adenosin with low-level exercise. Um, but it'll be, because it's a 10-second bolus, we can actually exercise the patient. And if they get to an adequate heart rate, we can give tracer. If they don't get it to an adequate heart rate, then we can go ahead and give regadenosin at peak exercise, for example. And so that's what we and others started to do. Off-label, um, if a, we'd take a patient and they um, referred for exercise or pharmacologic stress testing, exercised them hard. If they got to a good heart rate um, or got to an ischemic um, endpoint, we gave them radio tracer. If they didn't, we gave them regadenosin at peak exercise. Um, Randy Thompson and his group, um, as well as myself, looked at a group of 181 patients we gave regadenosin at peak exercise to. We compared them to 181 matched patients who underwent regadenosin at rest. And then we also compared them to 34 patients who underwent the regex low-level exercise protocol. And patients did better, as you can see in these patients shown in yellow, who underwent the regex protocol. Again, this is regadenosin at peak exercise, like a double stress. Um, those patients had less chest pain, less nausea, less flushing, less dizziness. Dysme was about the same. Um, the heart rate was more than we saw with our low level exercise, as you might increase, because you're giving something that's going to stimulate uh, that A2A receptor at peak exercise as well. So their heart rate afterwards was 118, a little higher than the heart rate we saw with low level exercise. Um, systolic blood pressure a little bit higher than we saw with low level exercise as well. So more of a hemodynamic effect giving regular innocent to peak exercise because they're already starting off with a high heart rate and blood pressure. And we, saw, we had a concern, however, some of these patients had a significant rise in blood pressure. Um, in 6% of the patients, they had a rise of 40 millimeters or more. 20 in, this, in, the, regu in the combined peak exercise regular innocent group compared to regular innocent at rest. Um, and 21% had a heart a systolic blood pressure increase of 20% along the way. And there was a mild increase in those patients who had a drop in blood pressure. And anecdotally, in giving it, we saw some patients get weak-legged when we gave regadenosin to peak exercise, um, and we were concerned if they'd come off the tread, fall off the treadmill, because we got two. They felt they already had the exercise effect, and then they got a regadenosin effect. Um, and so, because of this minority of patients having this, um, we were concerned that although it was tolerated by the vast majority, that perhaps we should give regadenosin recovery to allow them to cool down a bit. So because of this excessive hemodynamic response in a small number of patients, we said, let's try um, giving regadenosin recovery that would allow a, um, less of a hemodynamic effect combining exercise and uh, maximal exercise for that patient and regadenosin, let them cool down. And it also would create an opportunity to evaluate for ischemia that occurred during recovery. For example, some patients would develop um, ischemic changes in recovery with ST depression along the way, and then those patients you wouldn't want to give regadenosin to because you're giving, you already have an ischemic patient, so you don't want to give double stress to. You don't need to make a patient more ischemic by giving regadenosin. So we thought that it would allow more safety by giving it um, during recovery. And so we then pitched to, to Estellas um, a trial that ultimately we called EXERT um, that was funded, and as John said, we just presented a month ago. Um, it's the Exercise to Regan Innocent Recovery Trial, and you can see where we get the EXERT um, acronym, a Phase 3B open-label parallel group randomized multicenter study to assess Regan Innocent administered during slow walk recovery following inadequate exercise stress. And these are our co-authors here, and this has been accepted uh, provisionally at one of our major cardiology journals. Um, so the background is that if we're going to use low-level exercise, um, we have to know that before that. We have to the patient comes in, we're going to either give them farm stress at rest, low level of exercise, or exercise them. But this allows us to develop, again, what we talked about, a universal protocol that we can allow that patient to exercise as much as they could. If they get a good heart rate or get ischemia, then we give them tracer. If they don't, then we give them regadenosin during recovery. Um, this is off-label, and we recommended that a large randomized trial be done to look at safety and the potential advantages or disadvantages of it. So the aims were, just, aims were to look at the strength of agreement between SPECT imaging 
with Reagan and Nixon following inadequate exercise, submaximal exercise, and that the agreement between the initial picture we took with the combined protocol, the active therapy protocol, versus a resting protocol. So how close were the stress images when we looked at SPECT imaging, as well as to evaluate patient safety? Um, so it was particularly done in the United States. As you may know, there's a decreasing burden of ischemia seen on nuclear testing um, in the United States. So we encouraged uh, work abroad, and so we were able to do work with um, a site in Peru and sites in Argentina. And for those of you looking for to test ischemia, um, there's looks like there's been a decrease in atherosclerosis burden in the United States. So I'd encourage you to look abroad as an opportunity to find patients in a later stage of disease than we see them um, in the United States. So our study design was patients who were referred for pharmacologic stress, uh, who the investigator thought might be able to do some exercise and potentially achieve an adequate heart rate. Um, and so those patients were then, the, all patients underwent a resting spec study after randomization, excuse me, after enrollment, resting spec study. Then they went on, ex they exercised either using a Bruce or modified Bruce protocol. Um, the patients who were able to achieve adequate stress, either an ischemic endpoint or 85% maximum in five METs. Five METs is the recommended minimum exercise by ASNIC, um, in addition to the 85% maximum. Those patients received tracer and there were screen fails. Um, those patients who didn't get an adequate heart rate were then randomized to either the active therapy novel protocol, REG APEX, for REG adenosine after peak exercise, for REG APEX. And those patients received REG adenosine during the cool down, as we suggested earlier. Um, <clears throat> And uh, then they came back one to 14 days later for a regular and study at rest. So it was somewhat, it was similar to the pivotal trials um, comparing regadence to adenosin done 10 years ago uh, that John had so much to do with. So a patient had a study, an active therapy study, and then a study at rest one to 14 days later. Um, those patients who were randomized one to one to control, um, instead of getting regadence during recovery, those patients waited an hour, received regadence at rest. And they also returned one to 14 days later to get a regulus and study at rest. So this was comparing active to rest, um, and this was comparing rest to rest in terms of the images. So a little more detail. Again, the patients exercised using the Bruce or modified Bruce protocol. Um, they're randomized right after exercise. Um, so what we did is that uh, the study coordinator had an envelope, and after, if they didn't get to an adequate heart rate, um, during recovery, immediately they open the envelope and they're randomized to group one or group two. Those patients are randomized to group one or regular innocent at peak exercise. They continue to walk for five minutes during recovery. We came up with five minutes again. We wanted a three minute period of slow walking before we uh, to observe through ischemia before we gave regular innocent. And then we gave regular innocent over 10 seconds and then 30 seconds later gave radio tracer. We also had them walk for another minute and a half, again, thinking that that um, would allow. The, just like with low level exercise, that would allow, continue the heart rate to be up enough to get the impact of improved image quality um, as they walked over that period of time. And the patients came back 69 minutes later for their SPECT perfusion study. Um, group two patients um, underwent um, the same exercise protocol, then they're randomized in early recovery to, to control, to no uh, regadenosine during recovery. So they stopped um, after one or two minutes of walking recovery. They waited an hour, then they underwent regulus and at rest, as per the package insert, for example. Radio tracer 30 seconds later, then were imaged 60 to 90 minutes later. Each of those patients then came back for a second regulus and stress study. We call that MPI-2 versus the first one, MPI-1. And that, they came back one to 14 days later after their first study. And the second study was a regulus and at rest study, as per uh, the package, package insert, for example. Um, and the images were then interpreted at ICON by three readers um, at a core lab, and they were blinded to the reason for the study. The only thing they knew was they read the images were the gender. Um, they had no other information related to, those, to that. These were our three blinded readers, George, Hansen, and Juan. Um, <clears throat> so we asked them to interpret the studies based on a 17-segment model using a five-point typical perfusion scale, zero normal, four to absent. Um, in looking at the data, it's inter um, important to know that the segments were counted as reversible only if there was um, the rest stress score was greater than the rest score and the stress score is greater than two. Um, and this will be important as the paper comes out and you'll have more data to interpret. I'm, I'm, because the paper hasn't come out, I cannot present all the data, just the preliminary work. Um, 
So a defect where someone had a mild defect, only a mild de defect of one came into zero, that wouldn't be called an endpoint. That, that would not be called ischemic. It had to be moderate ischemia in any particular sigma to call that ischemic. Um, and the primary endpoint <clears throat> was the number of segments with reversible defects categorized as the absence or presence of ischemia. And again, this will be more important as the paper comes out. But we looked for the, look, we have, if there was just one defect that was abnormal, we actually called that a normal study, no ischemia, because it could have been artifactual, for example. Um, if there were two segments that had uh, moderate ischemia, we called that an ischemic um, segment. We call that patient ischemic because they had two or more segments. Um, the primary endpoint was defined as the intra-observer agreement. Most studies and the pivotal studies were inter-agreement studies. This is intra. Did the person, did the blinded reader agree with themselves? So did, for example, Dr. Wan, if he called something ischemic on the first study with reg apex, did they call it ischemic on the second study with reg and innocent rest? Um, or did he call it normal, for example? Um, and then did the, did the majority agreement was if two, were the, two of the three readers self-agreed, so were they consistent in their interpretation? So the primary endpoint was a majority agreement, yes, versus a majority agreement, no. That is, was there, were they reading in the same when the studies were presented to them? Um, the lower bound of our confidence interval for non-inferiority was minus 7.5%. That'll become a little more clear with these next slides. Our, our safety composite, um, as defined in working with the FDA, and this is an FDA-registered um, trial to potentially change the, change the package insert, was ventricular ischemia, ST depression or elevation, AV block or sinus arrest, or a major cardiac event within 24 hours of bregadenosin. Um, this is our study, um, our study disposition. Um, 1,400 patients were screened. 1,147 were randomized. So this represents the largest nuclear cardiology uh, trial in a decade that has a nuclear cardiology endpoint. Um, and so patients were randomized to reg apex, or the exercise um, protocol versus the control protocol. Ultimately, about 535 patients in each group. Some patients dropped out for various reasons along the way, but the vast majority were stayed in the trial. Um, the demographics were a mild majority of men compared to women, mostly white uh, individuals. Age was typical of a nuclear study at 62 years. Um, the primary endpoint we met, the primary endpoint, so the study was successful in that regard. Um, the agreement rate, majority agreement rate in the patients under the novel protocol was 92% of the agreeders agreed with themselves. Group two, the control group, they agreed with themselves 95%. The difference was minus 3%, 95 minus 3. And that's within the lower bound of the confidence interval of non-inferiority of minus 7.5%. So in other words, here's the, if, they, if the studies were much different, they'd be on this side, um, but the studies were um, similar, so they're right within the confidence limits here on this side of the boundary. Image quality uh, was improved um, to a mild degree. In these patients in group one, their first stress study, 42% of the studies were called excellent. 39% of the, the next time they came back were called excellent. Um, <clears throat> some of the state paper not shown in this slide is that some of the studies that were poor, there were more studies that were poor, um, we, took, we took them out of the whole trial if they were poor, and there are more that were shown in the group one trial, of the group one patients undergoing, excuse me, more poor studies when, they, when they're done without exercise. So there was a mild improvement in image quality, although not as much as we expected to see um, a priori. Um, the target to background ratio was better. The images were better because the patients were still exercising. Heart to background ratio shown in the red, the reg, the reg, the reg apex group was better. Heart to liver, heart to gut, or a combination of the two. Um, adverse events um, were the totaling adverse events were less common with the um, during the, with the new novel protocol. This is the group one. Those patients were randomized to reg apex. Their first study. They underwent regadinosin um, exercise, 52% um, adverse event, 58% when the same patients underwent regadinosin arrest. Serious adverse effects were greater in this group here, and we'll look at those in more detail now. These are the safety composite uh, predefined endpoint. Um, there are 3% of patients in the safety composite reached an endpoint in the group that got the novel therapy compared to the, those same patients who got Regnancy at rest one to 14 days later, or the control group who got two resting studies. 
Most of these 3% were EKG changes, ST depression or elevation. That is, patients already had ST changes with exercise during recovery, and it increased, or it was to the point that it was 2 millimeters or more after the regadenosine. Um, importantly, there were two clinically significant events that we'll talk about now. Um, one patient who got this novel protocol developed acute coronary syndrome, 55-year-old man, referred for jaw pain. He exercised on the Bruce protocol to five minutes and seven METs. He developed dyspnea, developed jaw pain, similar to what he came in for. He developed downsloping ST depression. He received regadenosine at three minutes and he developed um, chest pain, nausea, diaphoresis, received nitroglycerin. Um, he had actually developing one, he had developing ST elevation prior to regadenosin. He developed worse ST elevation inferiorly. I was sent to the cath lab and he had a subtotal occlusion of his right coronary, successfully treated, um, and he did not infarct. Um, this patient was actually, in retrospect, a protocol violation because he was ischemic prior to giving regadenosin. Again, we wanted to, um, a, if there was someone who was ischemic, had already had an endpoint, they should get tracer, or if they get ischemic in recovery, and they shouldn't be given regadenosin to have a double stress um, impacted. Um, another patient had a heart attack seven hours later. This is a patient post cabbage, again in the, in the active therapy group. He went for five minutes and six METs. He, during, exercise, during recovery, he developed lateral ST depression, inferior ST elevation that was mild. Post regadenosin, he developed chest pain, more ST elevation, got nitroglycerin. Um, back to normal by EKG, um, except for flat T waves at 60 minutes. He had um, four segments abnormal on his nuclear test, so he markedly abnormal scan. Um, and he came back, he was sent home 7.5 hours later, came back with a STEMI. Um, and he had a, a totally occluded proximal a lesion with the thrombus in his right coronary graft. This patient, again, should not have received regadenosin, but did um, despite the. Um, the protocol. Um, another patient was um, taken care of appropriately. This patient underwent exercise testing the boost protocol, chest pain at stage one. Um, by four minutes, he'd had SD um, changes. Um, exercise was stopped. He didn't receive regadenosin. He was sent to the cath lab, as you might, with a very early positive test. Um, and that patient um, received a stent for the right coronary. So looking at total adverse events, um, as I said, less of them with the novel protocol. Um, less headache, uh, less flushing, um, and a little more dizziness with this protocol. Um, so the conclusions of the study is we conclude that talk, the primary endpoint of non-inferiority of reader self-agreement, intra-observer agreement, um, for the presence or absence of ischemia was met. And Reagan Innes administered walk recovery didn't change the, the interpretation of the images of the blinded readers, and it resulted in improved target to gut and target to liver ratios. Um, <clears throat> however, there were two patients who had significant adverse effects. These patients were ischemic prior to giving regadenosin. Overall, it was well tolerated, um, and we saw the typical things with regadenosin, although somewhat less so. So our conclusions were that um, if the testing is done um, with careful observation for ischemia, that it's a reasonable test to do, the reg apex protocol. Um, but I think what we were surprised about is that um, when we think of an exercise test being done, we think of a cardiologist supervising the test, evaluating for ischemia. If they get ischemia, get tracer. But very often we have tests done by non-cardiologists or more um, or persons who are less comfortable calling something ischemic. And uh, because the protocol calls for they didn't get adequate heart rate, they go ahead and they give them regadenosin. So it requires us to carefully evaluate for ischemia if we're going to give regadenosin during recovery. Um, so in conclusion, the best form of stress is indeed exercise. But if a patient's referred for pharmacologic stress, if they clearly can't reach 85% heart rate, um, then I would consider regadenosin with low-level exercise, the reg apex protocol. Um, if a patient you think may be able to receive, um, re reach adequate heart rate, go ahead and exercise that patient. If they don't, if they don't have ischemia, then go ahead and give them regadenosin during recovery. Thank you very much. Any questions or thoughts? Great talk, Greg. Thanks very much. Um, you know, we routinely use um, exercise with, with farm stress. Um, and, I, and I think it's mostly based on your data because of the improvement in image quality, et cetera. 
um, the exercise on the fly, so to speak, in terms of uh, you know waiting. I guess the I guess the question would be in terms of what the optimal time to wait would be. I mean, you guys use three minutes post uh, maximal or sub maximal exercise. Right. Right. Do you think Do you think there needs to be a longer time period to really ensure that someone doesn't have a schema? You think three minutes is long enough? Uh, any thoughts on that? I think the study cost about twenty million dollars. So I think we're going to sit. We're going <laughs> to have to use the, the three minutes as a as a starting point. But I think it's a great question. Um, in giving it, I think I would just, I think I'd be just careful about doing it. You know, again, I think about doing it um, with someone very experienced looking for ischemia. I think three minutes is a quite reasonable time. If someone is not experienced in evaluating ischemia or new, I think that five minutes may be a longer period of time. In talking about this with colleagues who've given Reagan innocent at peak exercise, it's not, it's been it's been oh, maybe like one in a thousand patients. Someone will um, do terribly. They'll with that. They'll get more ischemic um, with regadenosine, um, and they'll go to the cath lab. Prem Soman has talked about that. Karthik um, at um, Henry Ford. Uh, it's been seen in Europe as well. So I think that it shouldn't be given in general at peak exercise. Um, and even as we in these three in these 500 patients who got it in our protocol, giving it three minutes still had challenges in two of those patients. So I think we need to be careful about doing it. Um, we did find um, in the control group those patients did well. That is, if they, so if someone gets ischemic um, and you haven't given tracer, for example, because they got ischemic during recovery, I think you can say safely you can wait an hour and give it. Right. Um, but where, where that right period of time is, I don't know. Right. So I think, it, again, it gets, you know, from our own perspective in terms of what we do every day, um, it's just, it's just important to be clinically astute in terms of what your patient's doing, right? So if your patient is already ischemic, it doesn't make a lot of sense to give a pharmacologic vasodilator. You've already proven the point, right? Exactly. So it's just we all need to be more cautious about what we do in terms of, I don't think the three minutes is such an, a pivotal issue as it is just really paying attention to the patient and seeing what's going on with the patient when we do our kind of stress testing. Are there any other questions? Well, we thank you very much for coming, Greg, and wonderful lecture. And um, it's a pleasure. And congratulations on what you've achieved over the years here in farm stress. We're we're building on that foundation. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, sir.